Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. What's new and exciting in your world this week? I have a story that begins with a piece of music. Listen to this. The piece goes on. That's just a sample. The first remarkable thing about this music is that it was written by 10-year-old Olive Wallace of Pennsylvania. Olive has played the violin for two years and decided to try her hand at composing. She wrote her composition in pencil in what's clearly a child's handwriting. There's a picture of this thing that I've seen. If Olive Wallace writes to us, I will send her a James Harrigan pencil pack so she can have some new and very exciting pencils. Her mother found the piece of paper, wondered what it would sound like, and so set in motion the second remarkable thing. Olive's mother posted a picture of the handwritten score on TikTok and said, quote, I need to know if it's any good or if it makes any sense. Christopher Hansen, director of music education at Seattle Pacific University, saw the picture of the score and arranged the piece for a string orchestra. He then recruited musicians attending the National Association of Music Education Conference who played it, and that's the recording you just heard. We've all experienced the internet as a cesspool of keyboard warriors saying horrible things to people that they would never say in person. But the internet also brings together people who happily give their time, talent, and treasure to connect with and to help others. Olive's mother, Dr. Hansen, and the musicians at the National Association of Music Education Conference brought a little girl's creation to life, and who knows, perhaps set Olive on a course to become a great composer. In the end, the internet, like every other tool humans have created, is as good or as bad as the people who wield it. And there are plenty of good people out there. That was actually pretty cool. I'm going I'm to give you credit for this week. Well done. <laughs> well done. I've got something much different. I don't know if you noticed, and frankly, I don't know if any other human being noticed, but Microsoft is busy now scrubbing Internet Explorer off users' computers. I heard something about that. It's about time. Internet Explorer was outdated a decade ago. It was outdated five minutes after it was released, given that there was Netscape at the time. The interesting thing here is that, yes, Microsoft stopped supporting Internet Explorer, but now it's actually, in an update, going into computers and removing it. You know, I'm sure you remember that Congress got involved once upon a time because Internet Explorer was such a threat. Right. What it was a threat about, I still haven't quite figured out. But look, there's an ebb and a flow in perfect evidence here. Internet Explorer, according to Congress, was this massive problem that had to be solved in the regulatory state. And yet, from just a few years into when it was released, it wasn't the browser of choice anyway. All these years later, Microsoft is trying to figure out how to get rid of it because it's embarrassing. Yeah, the market deselected Internet Explorer very early on. In fact, I can recall Congress was debating all of this. And those of us in the tech industry were wondering what's going on. Hardly anybody uses Internet Explorer anyway. Yeah, I was just an end user. I've never been in the tech industry. But as an end user, by the time Congress was debating it, I hadn't used it for a very long time. And Microsoft is now pushing its new browser out. I couldn't be any less interested than I am. Microsoft kind of lost me in the browser world a long, long time ago, and it's hard to get people back once you've lost them. I feel the same way, although I am watching Edge, their latest browser, for the sole reason that they claim they're going to be integrating Microsoft's version of artificial intelligence with it. That I'd like to see. Yeah, and every other browser is going to have it at exactly the same time. (laughs) And as soon as they do, I'm going to dump Edge and go to one of the others. (laughs) Yeah, I've been using Opera for a while now. It suits my needs. It's light. It's nimble. 
this is not the foolishness of the week, although I think it could have been. But with this rolled doll nonsense, I don't know what else could have been the foolishness of the week. Do you even know who Roald Dahl is? He's a writer. That's all I know. He is the author of many children's books, including Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Roald died quite some time ago, and his estate and his publisher got together, and they decided what they really needed to do was update Roald Dahl's books to make them safe for sensitive modern audiences. What is wrong with these people? The words are on the page. Roald wrote them. Now that's finished. If Roald himself wanted to change the books, I think it would have created a minor uproar. But, you know, authors are allowed to revisit their own work. When other groups of people decide to do it in the name of sanitizing the work, my backbone goes straight up. But you know, James, this is no different than the stories of taking masterpieces, which show nude whoever it is, Greeks or yeah, Romans. Painting and clothing painting, on them or yes, putting robes yeah, exactly. on a statue. Exactly. That's no different. And let's all stipulate that that ought never be done. Yeah. Once a work is complete to an author's satisfaction... It's finished. If it's offensive, don't look at it. Don't read it. That's exactly right. And there was more than a minor uproar over this, and they seem to have taken a couple of giant steps backwards. And I think right now they're talking about releasing rolled classic on the one hand and rolled updated on the other. And probably the best comment I've seen on this, this is not original to me, we shouldn't be worried about making classic works safe for sensitive modern ears. We should be making sensitive modern ears ready to read classic works. Yes. Not that I want to refer to this as classic, but in the spirit of the doll nonsense, they went right after James Bond, and the James Bond books written by Ian Fleming are now being all updated as well because they're offensive. I'm very interested in the two versions model. I can guarantee you what's going to happen is school districts across the country are going to purchase the one version and everybody else is going to purchase the other one. If you can't take a children's book, I don't know what to tell you. I'm guessing a lot of the people who are most exercised about these things don't read a whole lot of books in the first place. For one-stop shopping for all things James and Ant, visit our website, wordsandnumbers.org. If you're a full-time college student looking for something educational, fun, and free, apply to join me and James and several faculty who have appeared on Words and Numbers at the inaugural summer seminar on the theory and practice of classical liberalism. The week-long seminar is hosted by the Stevenson Institute at Wabash University and will be held June 5th through the 10th. There's no charge and meals and lodging are provided. To apply, see the link in the show notes. Phil Magnus is Director of Research and Education at the American Institute for Economic Research and a Research Fellow at the Independent Institute. Phil's research specialties include the economic history of the United States, the economic dimensions of slavery and racial discrimination, and the histories of taxation and economic inequality. In addition to prodigious research output, he has written for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Newsweek, Politico, Reason, and National Review. Phil Magnus has joined us yet again. I have to tell you, my mother absolutely loves it when you're on Words and Numbers. Got one fan at least. I guess your mother has deeply questionable taste, but <laughs> Phil's the kind of guest that you say one thing and you kind of wind them up and watch them go. I hear you've been watching some television. Indeed I have. It's called The 1619 Project, and it is a new series on Hulu that's the latest iteration of the New York Times' Pulitzer Prize-winning journalistic venture into the history of slavery. You have spent a lot of time in major media outlets debunking The 1619 Project, and yet Hulu is making a documentary about this? Well, I think what you find is that at the end of the day, it's not about history that they're pursuing here. This is all about a political message and therefore historical fact when it is challenged or when they are saying information that's just outright wrong, they don't really care. That's not the point here. The purpose is to tell a narrative and that narrative is to support a very progressive left-wing political agenda that's suitable for the year 2023 rather than any retrospective assessment of the past. Let's start at brass tacks because there might be a soul or two out there who has no idea what we're talking about. 
what was the 1619 project, and what's so important about the year 1619? So 1619 Project was the New York Times' journalistic reinvestigation, reimagining of American history that basically takes the African-American experience and the legacy of slavery discrimination and puts it at the center of the American tale. It picks the year 1619 because that's the year that the first slave ship arrives off the coast of Jamestown, Virginia, the first successful English colony in the New World. It's not the first set of slaves in North America. Those come with the Spanish almost a century earlier, but it is seen as kind of the starting point of the introduction of slavery into what becomes the United States. All right, so we're on relatively firm ground thus far. Those things all happened. Yeah, they're generally unobjectionable. And, you know, when the 1619 Project set off to make this series, do the study, I was initially excited. I was excited because it was bringing attention to a part of American history that often requires detail and nuance and depth to assess because it's a very emotional, very moralistic part of U.S. history that we need to take very seriously. But at the same time, it's one that often gets glossed over and taught in high school history textbooks as, well, there's this thing called the Civil War, slavery ended, and the rest is history. I was actually looking forward to it as well because I thought – you know, look, the New York Times has resources that most outlets can only dream of. Yeah. And if they're going to turn their attention to this thing from our history, they've got a running start and they might be able to get it right. Right, right. And yet, that's not how it broke. How long did it take for this to go off the rails and what exactly happened? I started reading this new issue of the magazine, and I got to the second essay. So the first essay, I started to notice some things were a little bit questionable some errors were made, but it had a coherent story it was telling. This was Nicole Hannah-Jones' lead intro. And the second essay is by Matthew Desmond, a sociologist at Princeton. He purports to investigate the economics of slavery surrounding slavery's supposed connection to the institution of capitalism, which is an area that, lo and behold, I had published quite a bit on, an area I've been working on for the better part of, well, I guess now two decades, basically since I was an undergrad. I'm reading this. And seeing error after error, factual claims that are just outright false, and a reliance on a very narrow set of academic literature we refer to as the New History of Capitalism School. It's a group of about a dozen or so historians at elite institutions, and their whole charge here is they take a progressive left narrative, assert that capitalism and slavery are wedded at the hip, and one taints the other. Therefore, capitalism is discredited and need major progressive reform in the modern day. That's kind of a mouthful. Can you unpack that a little more? Well, the end game, as we come to find out in the 1619 Project, is to make a political case for reparations, slavery reparations. And they have actually gotten a bit more specific on how much they want. They want $13 trillion with a T in payouts to supposedly close what they call the racial wealth gap. And the case here is that capitalism built wealth in the United States, so therefore it needs to be redistributed. Because capitalism is connected to slavery, so therefore slavery must be the cause of wealth in the United States, and redistribution is the just solution to this. But if this is the case, wouldn't we expect to see economic growth in the United States slow with the end of slavery? Well, that's the fascinating thing, because the New History of Capitalism School doesn't consider those types of counterfactuals. They've actually bought into an economic theory that was last seen and last popularized in the 1850s. You may know this, your listeners probably remember this from their high school history textbook, the King Cotton Theory of Economic Growth. And what it asserts is that cotton was such an essential staple crop to textile production, to trade, to commerce, to all sorts of derivative industries in the 19th century, that it and it alone is the major engine that jumpstarts the Industrial Revolution in the United States. So that's the basic assertion there. And this was last popular when the Confederacy was touting it all over the world to try to get uh, European powers to join their side of the Civil War. They said, we're the economically superior region of the United States because we have cotton on our side, and none would dare make war upon cotton because cotton is the source of your wealth as well as our wealth. Therefore, join our side. We're going to win the war based on the superiority of this product that we happen to have from our plantation system. But turns out the Civil War doesn't play out that way. The northern economy just wallops the south in terms of industrial prowess, munitions, ability to field armies, everything. 
The, the conflict draws on in a very bloody way, but it's not a conflict that was on equal terms economically. In fact, it just exposes the South as kind of this backwater that has a few very, very wealthy plantation owners that are certainly making money off of cotton. But what really happens in the Civil War is when the blockade cuts off the American cotton source out of the South, Britain and France and all these other empires that have textile mills that they are drawing on previously American imports, they just go elsewhere in the world. They go to Egypt, they go to the Caribbean, they go to India, and they start sourcing their cotton elsewhere. And the Confederacy is like, what the hell, guys? I don't want to get into the game of parsing definitions, but Hannon Jones and company are using the word capitalism in a way that economists don't. When we talk about capitalism, Included in that idea is the concept of private property, which includes, among many other things, that a person owns his or her own labor. Slavery is antithetical to capitalism. Does Hannah Jones attempt to square economist definitions of capitalism with the definition she appears to be using? Not at all. And in fact, they go in the other direction. They play word games. So basically, the institutions that they describe as capitalistic are something that most economists would refer to as mercantilism, a slave mercantilism connected to kind of this quasi-feudal throwback, which, you know, slave plantation owners are quite explicit in their own defenses of the institution. They see themselves as the heirs to the medieval lords that have feudal serfs on their land. They've just migrated over across the sea and turned it into a plantation house. So no one in the 19th century would look at slavery and say, this is the essence of capitalism. In fact, it's quite the opposite of that. Most of the slave owners view capitalism as a threat because capitalism is associated with free labor, competitive labor. In fact, George Fitzhugh, who's one of the leading defenders of slavery in the eve of the Civil War, writes a book called The Sociology for the South. This comes out in the early 1850s. And one of his opening salvos in the book basically says we need to take the works of Adam Smith and all these economists, these capitalistic economists, and cast them into the fire if slavery is to survive. Because this economic system is at odds with the way that we do things in the South. In fact, we've perfected order, whereas capitalism is chaos. This is baffling. Given all of this, Jones and her followers should be standing arm in arm with free market economists. And yet they seem to be picking a fight that doesn't exist except in their own minds. What's the point? Well, the point is $13 trillion. Yeah. How did we get from all of this hot nonsense to something that you could run on TV on Hulu? Yeah. Clearly something had to be massaged to get this put together in a way that people might actually tune in. A lot of people have to be holding their noses while they're doing this. Yeah. Part of it is the way the New York Times has handled its response to academic critics. And those criticisms started immediately off the bat in 2019 when this first issue comes out. I think I may have had one of the first or second piece out of the gate because when they wrote the article on capitalism and slavery, a few days later, National Review contacted me and said, hey, can you write up an assessment of this? And I did. It was published. Soon other historians start to chime in and they focus on some of the other deficiencies. It has this whole claim about the American Revolution being basically a pro-slavery revolution, and that's caused a lot of backlash with good reason against the series. But the way the New York Times responded to all of these criticisms, it wasn't, we're going to go back and look at the evidence and tighten up our narrative. It wasn't, we're going to run corrections to factual errors. I had two very lengthy exchanges with the editor's department at the New York Times because, you know, they pride themselves on this paper that will correct mistakes that are found years or even decades after the fact. And I pointed them to unambiguous errors in their statistical claims and their representation of sources and just got blown off, told that, well, these are interpretive differences. And yet at the same time, they were also doing things behind the scenes, like making problematic lines disappear off of their website without disclosing it. This is another discovery I made a couple months into the saga about it. And then at the end of the day, it really comes down to the creator of it, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who's been kind of the public face of it. She does not take criticism well, certainly not constructive criticism. Her immediate reaction when you had some very eminent historians, Gordon Wood, James McPherson, Victoria Bynum, Jim Oakes, Sean Wilentz. These are well-known, well-regarded historians of the Revolution and the Civil War era. They pointed out some basic errors, 
and she starts tweeting all these crazy things like, well, they're white historians or who considers them prominent? I certainly don't. Just this real derisive approach that we're not going to engage the academic critics. And when that started, it kind of sent a signal across the academy and sent a signal into the media world that the New York Times was not going to be responsive to assessments of its factuality. Rather, it was carrying a political narrative. And then you get the woke segment of the academy, you get the political left, they throw their weight in and say, yeah, we're going to go behind this because we also want the political objectives of the 1619 Project. We don't care about the facts. The facts are just a weapon to use for those objectives. I remember, Phil, looking at the 1619 Project, at the initial announcement, the first batch of output, and it was striking. You brought up Gordon Wood a second ago. And if there's a historian of the revolutionary and pre-revolutionary period alive and well right now who should be consulted on these matters, if there's one in the entire country, it's Gordon Wood. Yes. I don't know a single academic who would think anything other than what I just said. Yeah. And he's nowhere to be found in the 1619 Project. How do you not have the guy when you're putting together a project? And then I later found out that not only did they not have him, they didn't try to have him. No, not interested in it at all. And it gets even worse than that. We found out about six months after it came out. So the New York Times, being a journalistic venture, they sent off the original essays to fact checkers. And one of those was a historian of the American Revolution named Leslie Harris, another very distinguished, well-known scholar in that space. And they asked her to fact check this claim that the American Revolution was tied to a defense of slavery. And she responds to it, says, don't run with that. Uh, This is an error. This is a problem. And they basically just ignored her. And she broke her silence about six months later and says, hey, I tried to warn them against this controversy, and they just blew me off Mm. because they had a narrative they wanted to carry, and that narrative involved discrediting the American founding, discrediting the American experience, because that's all necessary to build this political case in the present day. She's right. You can't make that case. Right. It's not there. You can want it to be there, but that doesn't make it so. That's exactly it. And that's what we see. So we jump over into the Hulu series. They're still trying to revive and resuscitate that case because it was the one area after Leslie Harris runs her piece in Politico, after there's backlash and controversy, the New York Times briefly started to walk back that claim. But ever since then, Nicole Hannah-Jones has tried to double down and reinsert it and bolster it back up. And then it moves to front and center in episode one of the Hulu series. And she really ends up sounding a lot like a crazy person. I've lost a lot of respect from her. I mean, I didn't start on the same assessment of her that I have today. Part of this comes from my own back and forth with her. She's someone who goes straight into derision and insult, does not want to debate the substance or facts of the matter. It's all about preserving her narrative. She'll attack anyone that even questions her, no matter how mild, no matter how factual, and often in very crude and abusive ways. I've gotten some of the scorn from her, but it's actually the African-American critics that she goes after the hardest. I mean, she comes very close to calling them an Uncle Tom. She had a very derisive comment the other day about Thomas Sowell, the economist. She tweeted out to the world, said that the only reason people care about Thomas Sowell's opinions on race is because he's black. It's just like this crude denouncing of him, even though he's an accomplished scholar with a half dozen books on economic dimensions of race. When I read the nonsense that was coming off of her fingertips about Sol, I really wondered whether she'd ever even heard of him. Right. I'm trying to figure out the motivation here. Does this all come down to money? Is it that $13 trillion claim? Does she think people are going to take that seriously? Well, that's the big question of it. It does seem that every episode of the series, just as every chapter of the book, they've tried to build up this case that reparations are the obvious solution to every problem that they document. And I'll give some credit to the book. The lesser known chapters, the ones that have not been the source of controversy, are generally solid scholarship. There's investigations of African-American music. There's investigations of modern day prison policy in the way that it has racially discriminatory effects. There's art, there's literature, No one really objects to these chapters. It's really the political ones that are all building toward this case for reparations. 
And that starts with Nicole Hannah Jones. It starts with her attacks on the American Revolution, moves into Matthew Desmond, which is this whole narrative about capitalism being wedded to slavery and therefore tainted, and then comes full circle in the end that this is something that requires remediation through the U.S. government and an aggressive reparations policy. As far as its seriousness, I mean, Nicole Hannah Jones absolutely claims that this is a serious goal, as do many of her defenders and supporters in the media world. I don't think she has a viable policy here because, you know, you're talking a $13 trillion payout. That's more than half of the GDP of the entire United States in a given year. These are astronomical numbers. If I were to take this seriously, and here I'm speaking as someone who has served as an expert witness in court cases like this, albeit for much smaller numbers, if I were to take it seriously, I would have to ask, to whom are we making this claim? Certainly not the northern states. And furthermore, what about the hundreds of thousands of lives and tremendous amounts of money the North spent eradicating slavery? Where does that show up in the calculations? And then, and this is going to sound horrible, but it's a question the courts always ask, how much better off are descendants of slaves today given that they are in the United States versus where they would be otherwise? And I understand how horrible that sounds, but I'm simply applying the same sorts of questions a court would apply in any case that it took seriously. You can add on to that. What culpability does a descendant of an immigrant that came over on a ship in 1910 have? Right. And what is the culpability of someone who is a descendant of both white and black ancestors? Absolutely. These are very complex questions. They're moral questions. In addition on to that... Wealth does not situate for multiple generations among the descendants of plantation owners. It tends to dissipate among the heirs, especially if you're 150, 200 years removed. The descendant of a plantation owner may be a middle-class suburbanite in Cleveland today and have no idea that this is their ancestor. But it seems to me if Nicole Hannah-Jones wanted people to take this argument seriously, she'd have to address these questions. And she does not. But that's just the thing. Everybody knows that a $13 trillion ask is going to fall on dead ears. That's not possible. And there's no way that we could even plan to do it. There's not some kind of magic installment plan that's going to ever make this happen. And you start to ask yourself some much harder questions. What is it about Jones that she thinks she can throw this kind of nonsense around? And this is going to seem very strange to people who use these words. She has a position of utter privilege. Absolutely. And she gets to play by different rules than the rest of us. What's she really trying to accomplish? I would submit that she's trying to enhance her privilege. And enhance her own personal resume. No, that's right. This is very similar to what we saw from, say, Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton over the course of a decade or two, when it was never exactly clear what problem they were seeking to ameliorate, but it was very clear that they were going to come out of it much better than they went in. You see this in the way that she is publicizing and promoting the 1619 Project. She's going around to small town libraries and charging them $40,000 a pop to give a one-hour lecture. Some of these talents, that's like half the budget of the library for the year. Who is paying $40,000? The answer there are uh, politicians and bureaucrats that are politically aligned, not with the history, but with the political objectives of the 1619 Project. It's all about virtue signaling. Sometimes it's university administrators that see her and, you know, this is a way to signal your wellness. This is a way to signal that you're on board with uh, good progressive causes as you bring in a speaker who's probably not worth that in terms of the intellectual merit of what she is arguing. But she certainly got the game down on figuring out how to charge these types of fees. Forgive my naivete here, but... What do universities gain by appearing to the public to be woke? Well, I think it comes to the end of the day, most universities are not what they advertise themselves to the public as being. You know, they say they're serving the public by educating the next generation. No, it's not that at all. It's in many cases, it's a source of employment and a source of prestige for people who want to be political activists for their career. It's funny you say that because I've been an academic for, what, 25 plus years, and It's often occurred to me that one of the main services that academia provides to the rest of society 
is to collect a bunch of very smart people who often don't appreciate the limits of their own understanding and lock them away in ivory towers where they can do as little damage to the rest of us as possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that may well be the case, but now they've gained an activist charge. Part of this comes from the university system itself. Most people don't realize how far to the left it's moved in a very, very short period of time. You can go back to the late 1990s, early 2000s, and there's still a relative semblance of diversity of viewpoint on campus. All of that has gone away. The faculty hiring and replacement of retiring faculty has moved in a hard left direction. We see this in survey data. It used to be the universities were about 40, 45 percent on the political left, and that's the biggest category, but you have substantial minorities of moderates, conservatives, everything in between. Where is it today? It's a super majority on the political left. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues, and send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, try to be nice to one person. One person who doesn't deserve it. Just one. And who knows, it may turn into a trend. Give it a shot. You might feel good about yourself. You could say you tried. You tried, that's right. Till next week, can't take it easy. See you next week, James.